Hey there, and welcome to the New Discourses Podcast. This is James Lindsay, and we're going to do something different today. You know I like to read the literature, so we're going to read the literature, so it's not that different. But what we're going to do is we're going to dip out of this literally interminable critical education and critical pedagogy series that I'm doing, and we're going to dip into queer theory. So, you know, some of you will have heard the Groomer Schools podcast series, and you will have heard that summary of how both the Marxists, you know, have used sexual education of children to destabilize society. You will have heard the paper, if you've listened to the second part of that series, by Hannah Dyer explaining about how queer theory should remold early childhood education and childhood development theories so that we teach sex to children earlier. You will have heard, if you listen to the third part of that series, how the sex aspect of this, or queer aspect, queer theory aspect of this, and the critical race theory aspects work kind of like a one-two punch to reproduce Mao's identity-based radicalization program. What we are going to do today, though, is we're going to go to roots. We're going to do something um, I should have done a long time ago. It's just there's so many things to do, so many different topics to hit. I'm not going to read a contemporary queer theory paper. I'm not going to read a a particularly shocking, although it is shocking, but a particularly shocking queer theory paper. In fact, I'm not going to read a paper that's technically even labeled as queer theory. I'm going to read the paper that's considered to be, the essay that's considered to be the first queer theory paper, which is called Thinking Sex by Gail Rubin, written in 1984. So this is some time ago. I mean, just not to put too fine a point on it, but it 1984 was nearly 30 years ago. Try not to think about that if you're feeling old all of a sudden. But this essay was really a um, shot heard around the feminist world, if you will. It really was a direct shot. And we'll probably have to do this essay in two pieces because it's very long. And the second piece will actually engage the direct shot Gail Rubin is taking at feminism primarily, but this was a shot at the feminist world that said that we need a completely new politics of sex and sexuality. And queer theory is what resulted. I think queer theory received its name either in 91 or 93, a few years later, not that these things matter that much. Um, This being, you know, so better part of half, three quarters of a decade later, queer theory is kind of coming into its own But here's where it begins with this essay, Thinking Sex, Notes for a Radical Theory of the Politics of Sexuality. It lays it right out. This is the set of ideas that over the next seven to ten years evolved into what became named queer theory that since then has evolved to the point where one of the major targets is the innocence of children, rethinking childhood education and childhood development theories like we hear from Hannah Dyer, the queering of every subject, As it happens, it will be obsolete by the time this comes out, who knows when, but today on Twitter I went through and showed just a series of academic papers, querying history classes, querying math classes, uh, querying English classes, querying elementary ed, querying uh, fourth grade classrooms, just querying preschool, just paper after paper after paper after paper, bringing queer theory into education. Just like where critical race theory had some but limited success in law, critical race theory had great success when it went into education. Queer theory has also had great success going into education, and now we have groomer schools. And this kind of big, long trajectory starts with these feminist sex wars in the 80s. As it turns out, there was two major branches of radical feminism in the 80s, sex negative feminism and sex positive feminism. We're not going to get deeply into that, but this paper sits at that rift. Gail Rubin was in the sex positive category. Um, Many of the feminist luminaries at the time were in the sex negative category. From what I understand, though I don't know this for certain, Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, which is prominent in the news, you know, every few months since the last few years or whatever, was actually written as an allegory for the dystopia that could come if the sex-negative feminists, who are radical leftists, teamed up with the sex-negative social conservatives, who are fairly right-wing, and were able to gain enough power to create a sex-negative society. Um, So that was a kind of sex-positive feminist shot at uh, the um, 
sex-negative feminists saying that they had a lot to do in common with social conservatives. And that's probably where their commentary, their dystopian commentary, was actually aimed. So Gail Rubin's a sex-positive feminist, and queer theory grows out of this branch of sex-positive feminism. Primarily, uh, it largely grows out of um, lesbian even separatism, <laughs> as it were, but lesbian, radical lesbian feminist politics. And so, the, again, the subtitle here is Notes for a Radical Theory of the Politics of Sexuality. This is by Gail S. Rubin. The main title is Thinking Sex from 1984. The first section, we're going to go through a few of the sections today, and we'll do a couple more sections in another episode. The first section is The Sex Wars. And it starts off with a long quote, Asked his advice, Dr. J. Guerin affirmed that after all the other treatments had failed, he had succeeded in curing young girls affected by the vice of onanism by burning the clitoris with a hot iron. I apply the hot point three times to each of the large labia and another on the clitoris. After the first operation from 40 to 50 times a day, the number of voluptuous spasms was reduced to three or four. We believe, then, that in cases similar to those submitted to your consideration, one should not hesitate to resort to the hot iron and at an early hour in order to combat the clitoral and vaginal onanism in the little girls. So, this is a tactic that was horrible, right? I didn't even trigger warning you. That was horrible. This is a tactic. You frame something out. This is what you, you see throughout all this kind of radical leftist literature. Why do we have to have radical leftism? Because without it, look at all these terrible things. And then they hold themselves up as though they're offering the only valid criti pathway to critique for these horrible things. So that's the framing uh, for this section and for this whole paper is they were burning little girls' clitorises because they didn't want them to have sexual feelings. They didn't want them to have sexual stimulation, and they certainly didn't want them to sexually stimulate themselves. And so this is how she's trying to frame this out to say this is how our screwed up society thinks about sex. So we need sexual liberation. And look how horrible it is to little girls when we get these things wrong. So she begins, and what I'm going to do actually is read a couple of paragraphs of this. And then I'm going to jump to the very end and read a note on definitions that she offers. And then I'm kind of going to come back to the essay. Mostly for this, I'll have some commentary, of course, but I'll be able to read a lot straight through. I just want to expose you. This is what queer, this is the origin point of queer theory. And you're going to hear some things that shock you. Like that was shocking, but that's not what I mean. You're going to hear outright apology for defense of um, perversion in her own words. You're going to hear the defense of um, blowing or blowing out any kind of norms of decency or propriety. That's perversion, I guess. You're going to hear defenses of child pornography. You're going to hear defenses of uh, pedophilia, but she's got, she knows better. So she's going to mention it, but she's also going to hide it behind a specialized term about cross generational sexual activity. And so this is queer theory. This is literally where it started. And we're going to hear all of that defenses of perversion saying that being a pervert is unfairly stigmatized in society, defenses of child pornography, defenses of um, pedophilia. We're going to hear all of that in this paper. This is the starting point of queer theory. So she begins this way. The time has come to think about sex. To some, sexuality may seem to be an unimportant topic, a frivolous diversion from the more critical problems of poverty, war, disease, racism, famine, or nuclear annihilation. But it is precisely at times such as these, when we live with the possibility of unthinkable destruction, that people are likely to become dangerously crazy about sexuality. Contemporary conflicts over sexual values and erotic conduct have much in common with the religious disputes of earlier centuries. They acquire immense symbolic weight. Disputes over sexual behavior often become the vehicles for displacing social anxieties and discharging their attendant emotional intensity. Consequently, sexuality should be treated with special respect in times of great social stress. The realm of sexuality also has its own internal politics, inequities, and modes of expression. As with other aspects of human behavior, the concrete institutional forms of sexuality at any given time and place are products of human activity. 
So we're already getting pretty deep in here. So I'm going to have to break some of this down and then we'll do the definitions. They are imbued with conflicts of interest in a political maneuver, both deliberate and incidental. In that sense, sex is always political. Sex is always political, right here in the second paragraph. But there are also historical periods in which sexuality is more sharply contested and more overtly politicized. In such periods, the domain of erotic life is, in effect, renegotiated. Okay, so we're going to get historical with her in a minute. We're going to do definitions first. Let me just kind of kind of point out what's going on here. So she's framing out saying, oh my God, we have all these crises. We need to talk about sex. And the reason if you get down to it is because these are the times when sexual politics or other politics are going to get renegotiated. But also she's already hinted that these are the times when people start to get religious and weird about sex. We're going to, she's going to be alluding, for example, to a lot of kind of religious pure, pure, tanical kind of views, I guess, that, you know, we've got wrong with God, so we deserve whatever crazy punishment, whether it's nuclear annihilation, whether it's Sodom and Gomorrah, whatever it happens to be. So poverty, war, disease, racism, famine, nuclear annihilation, these risks actually make people crazier, what she's insisting about sex. And so this is when sex becomes craziest, and this is when we have to think about it and talk about it most. Disputes over sexual behavior, she said, often become the vehicles for, displace, for displacing social anxieties and discharging their attendant emotional intensity. So you're freaking out about other stuff, and so you take it out on sex. You transfer it to sex. That's what she's saying. And then so consequently, sexuality should be treated with special, special respect in times of great social stress. Okay. And then it goes straight into the Foucauldian postmodern. Okay, so that's the end of the first paragraph. The second paragraph is, is, is Michel Foucault's postmodern theories of sexuality, which of course are cited, and in fact, as the kind of the bedrock for Gail Rubin. So now we've talked a lot about critical theory here on the podcast, but now we have to actually get into postmodern thought a little bit to understand the postmodernists were obsessed, especially Foucault, with sex, especially with child sex and with uh, BDSM sex, uh, both of which Foucault was into, both of which Foucault was repressed about, also gay sex, which Foucault was also repressed for, um, and which you could make a convincing argument that a lot of his, his philosophy, if you want to call it that, is attempting to deal with that fact and to change the situation so he can kind of get his way. And so this is where that second paragraph picks up. This, the realm of sexuality also has its own internal politics, inequities. So all the way back in 84, we're talking about inequities and modes of oppression. As with other aspects of human behavior, the concrete institutional forms of sexuality at any given time and place. So there's your social contingency hypothesis at the social constructivist level. So now we're saying, oh, wait, there are different kinds of sexual politics in play all the time that restrict people's lives, etc. And they vary from time and place. And they are always, she says, the products of human activity. They're socially constructed. So now she's explicitly declaring that we're going to approach what will become queer theory th through a lens of social constructivism. And so she says there's all these political maneuvers, conflicts of interests, etc. So sex itself is political. The way that society regards what is and is not appropriate in sexual behavior and sexual expression, which is also going to include gender expression and then sex, you know, like assigned at birth expression, the way that all of that happens is going to be lumped into this social construction box under queer theory. And that's what it's going to be. You're going to hear this idea. You've heard me say repeatedly, we frame out the fourth chapter of cynical theories, which is about queer theory as that it's a war against the normal. You've heard me explain that queer theory, it, a podcast here on New Discourses, for example, or if you've listened to many of my talks, that queer theory is a Marxist theory of normalcy. The idea that there is a normal way to be, especially with regard to sex, gender, and sexuality, but also other things, mental health status, physical health status, fat status, ability status, etc., that is enforced socially and oppresses people who are abnormal or queer against that norm. And so it's a Marxist theory of normalcy. And all of that's being invoked here already, but under the social constructivist model that this is actually socially constructed. Sex, gender, sexuality are socially constructed and political because all social constructions in Marxist thought are actually political constructions. We did a podcast about that too. Okay, so the kind of summarizes that couple of paragraph introduction by saying, well, right now is one of these periods of history. This is why the time has come to think about sex, the opening sentence. Because there are times when things get more political 
and the domain of erotic life has to be renegotiated. So she wants to take that in a particular direction. Now we're going to use a lot of terms throughout this apparently. So I'm just going to read her a note on definitions so we can know what she means. It's at the bottom. I didn't even realize, you know, until I got to the bottom last time I read it, which was a few weeks ago. Throughout this essay, she says, I use terms such as homosexual, sex worker, and pervert. I use homosexual to refer to both women and men. If I want to be more specific, I use terms such as lesbian or gay male. Sex worker is intended to be more inclusive than prostitute in order to encompass the many jobs of the sex industry. Sex worker includes erotic dancers, strippers, porn models, nude women who will talk to a customer via telephone hookup and can be seen but not touched, phone partners, and the various other employees of sex businesses such as receptionists, janitors, and barkers. Obviously, it also includes prostitutes, hustlers, and male models. I use the term pervert as a shorthand for all of the stigmatized sexual orientations. It is used to cover male and female homosexuality as well, but as these become less disreputable, the term has increasingly referred to other deviations. Terms such as pervert and deviant have, in general use, a connotation of disapproval, disgust, and dislike. I'm using these terms in a denotative fashion and do not intend them to convey any disapproval on my part. Well, as a matter of fact, because she's actually putting forth a Marxist theory, I won't add to her, but I will echo off of what Kimberly Crenshaw said a few years later in Mapping the Margins in 1991, that embracing a term like queer or pervert for these fine activists is a mode of two things giving an anchor for subjectivity in the politicized identity category, and also mount from that politicized identity as an anchor of subjectivity, mounting an effective uh, politics of resistance. That's what Crenshaw calls it. So she also uses these words with a slightly um, rebellious connotation to them as well. Uh, not as explicitly as will come down later when queer has been fully seized and queer theory gets named based off of this new radical politics of sexuality and sex that Gail Rubin is suggesting. But that's got to be kept in the back of the mind because that's what queer theory came into existence in the end to do. Um, what does that mean, by the way, an anchor for subjectivity? Well, with Marx, just to go all the way back, Marx said that what makes man human is that he is a conscious subject. And what limits man is that society produces social relations that are socially constructed that limit the range of his subjectivity. In other words, his ability to imagine himself and the world that he is in through alienation, estrangement, etc. And so in his limited subjective range, he doesn't understand the true nature of the reality he finds himself in or his capacity to be a creator that can change it, that can transform the world into the Marxist communist utopia. Okay, so anchor for subjectivity means, as an identity, means that your identity becomes the way that you realize that you are a conscious subject who can create the world that you wish to live in by transforming the world that we have. That, in fact you're being conditioned to believe that there are certain ways to be, normal ways in this case for queer theory, and that it is possible to awaken to the conditioning that you're under, the brainwashing that society is giving you, and see outside of that box, and to imagine different possibilities, and then to transform the world to manifest those possibilities in reality, which, because there is a degree of social construction to many things, there's some truth to, but not as much truth as these people put into it. So that's really what's going on. That's the anchor for subjectivity. What is a fruitful politics of, of resistance? Um, it's what it sounds like. It's a way to fight back. Uh, little Right around the same time this essay was being written, another essay was being written by a post-colonialist by the name of Gayatri Spivak. And since Spivak relies so heavily on Foucault and at times Derrida, whom she translated into English, two postmodern theorists, we can say that Gayatri Spivak was in fact a postcolonial theorist rather than a postcolonialist uh, designation I use to point out that she's using a Marxist theory of postcoloniality, I suppose is the way you would phrase that. And in that she calls for a um, 
an, a strategy. I was trying not to use the word twice called strategic essentialism, a technique called strategic essentialism, where what you do is you take on the characteristics of the stereotype you're being painted with and use it as a weapon back at people. The exa- you could think of an example like, you know, um, if there was a stereotype that a particular race is dumb, then the race could be, you know, at work or whatever, be told to do something and say, I don't know, boss, I'm too dumb to do it. The kind of passive aggressive crap that you'll find that a very angry spouse will often do to you when they've been stung. Um, but also to lean into the stereotypes of for the colonial context of being backwards, primitive, or whatever else, and too stupid to be able to do this. This is actually a technique that can cut both ways. When the Democrats, a good example of this being cutting the other direction was when the Democrats said that black before the election in 2020, that black people didn't know how to use computers to get ID or vote or something like that. There were a lot of hilarious videos of black people jumping around a computer as if they were, you know, some kind of a primitive tribesman or an ape or something, having no idea what it was. And like, they're somewhat afraid of it. Uh, so that's strategic essentialism, um, being weaponized against BS. So it can cut both ways. It's a technique, but here a positive discourse, uh, for a politics of resistance. That's where Kimberly Crenshaw famously says that, uh, you know, we're going to lean into, I am black instead of, I'm a person who happens to be black, which is, um, has become quite the, the monster. We have the same thing happening with queer under queer theory. So we'll continue. We've now spent a long time introducing this historical analysis. She gives, um, in England and the United States, she says, in the late 19th century, sorry, the late 19th century was one such era where erotic, the domain of erotic life was renegotiated. During that time, powerful social movements focused on vices of all sorts. There were, edu- there were educational and political campaigns to encourage chastity, to eliminate prostitution, and to discourage masturbation, especially among the young. Morality crusaders attacked obscene literature, nude paintings, music halls, abortion, birth control information, and public dancing. The consolidation of Victorian morality and its apparatus of social, medical, and legal enforcement was the outcome of a long period of struggle whose results have been bitterly contested ever since. Of course, there are some degrees of truth to that, and there are some degrees of validity to the other side of the argument that, of course, our Marxist friend here will not want to acknowledge. The consequences of these great 19th century moral paroxysms are still with us. They have left a deep imprint on attitudes about sex, medical practice, child rearing, parental anxieties, police conduct, and sex law. The idea that masturbation is an unhealthy practice is part of that heritage. During the 19th century, it was commonly thought that premature interest in sex, premature by the way, so we're now talking about children, is in scare quotes. That premature interest in sex, so what? The, why is it in scare quotes? What does that imply? This is a very common postmodern technique. It means people call it premature, but that raises a question of if something is actually premature, if there is a proper mature point at which interest in sex becomes relevant before which it is to be considered premature. It's the same trick as that where they say in fat studies that to say overweight, which we could put in quotes to say quote overweight is to imply that there is a correct weight that you are over here. That's to imply there is a correct degree of maturity to be interested in sex that you are under. And so it was commonly thought that, quote, premature interest in sex, sexual excitement, and above all, sexual release would impair the health and maturation of a child. So we're talking about kids jerking off. Let's just cut through the BS. Theorists differed on the actual consequences of sexual precocity. Some thought it led to insanity, while others merely predicted stunted growth. To predict the young, sorry, to protect the young from premature arousal, parents tied children down at night so they would not touch themselves. Doctors excised the clitorises of onanistic little girls. There's your little introductory thing that we read. And so here are some pretty extreme examples of pe- things people did to curb masturbation. I think it's kind of funny she doesn't mention John Kellogg's program to feed people literally 
boring grain as food to discourage the passions or his relentless campaign to that was cornflakes by the way that was the point of cornflakes was to get boys not to play with their, their willies um or mentioning male circumcision here but i digress although the more gruesome techniques have been abandoned meaning hey guess what we don't actually do that anymore but now we have to worry about how the attitudes have shaped the social context because that's all these people think about Although the more gruesome techniques have been abandoned, the attitudes that produce them persist. See, the notion that sex per se is harmful to the young has been chiseled into extensive social and legal structures designed to insulate minors from sexual knowledge and experience. Like, that's actually literally what the word minors means. Like, it's literally what the word minors means. The notion that sex per se is harmful to the young has been chiseled into the extensive social and legal structure. Isn't it weird that we're like four paragraphs into this and she's already talking about child sex? Like that's all she's focused on. We need to have a conversation about sex. Let's talk about kids playing with themselves. Let's talk about child sex overall. This is where queer theory came from. There is a cogent argument to be made. It probably goes too far. I'm not prepared to make it that the entirety of leftism for some time, certainly back through the postmodernists or Foucault at the least, but possibly well before that, is really just system, what do I want to say, systemic pedophilia or structural pedophilia trying to be codified into the system. That's the first thing she talks about, literally the first thing she talks about, child sex. And why we have to question implicitly, by the way she's worded it, we have to question implicitly why, why do we even think that sex is harmful to young people? Much of the sex law currently on the books, she says, also dates from the 19th century morality crusades. Remember, it's outdated that we have sex laws and that we criminalize child sex. That's the implication she's making right out of the, right out of the gate. This is the first queer theory paper. The first federal anti-obscenity law in the United States was passed in 1873. The Comstock Act, named for Anthony Comstock, an ancestral anti-porn activist and the founder of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, made it a federal crime to make, advertise, sell, possess, send through the mails, or import books or pictures deemed obscene. The law also banned contraceptive or abortifacient drugs and devices and information about them. In the wake of the federal statute, most states passed their own anti-obscenity laws. The Supreme Court began to whittle down both federal and state Comstock laws during the 1950s. By 1975, the prohibition of materials used for and information about contraception and abortion had been ruled unconstitutional. However, Although the obscenity provisions have been modified, their fundamental constitutionality has been upheld. Thus, it remains a crime to make, sell, mail, or import material which has no purpose other than sexual arousal. I don't know if that's still true from 1984 or not. Although sodomy statutes date from... I did mention Sodom and Gomorrah, didn't I? Although sodomy statutes date from older strata of the law when elements of canon law were adopted into civil codes, most of the laws used to arrest homosexuals and prostitutes come out of the Victorian campaigns against white slavery. So you see a little intersectional flair happening there from the very beginning. These campaigns produce the myriad prohibitions against solicitation, lewd behavior, loitering for immoral purposes, age offenses and brothels and bowdy houses. In her discussion of the British white slave scare, historian Judith Walkowitz observes that, quote, recent research delineates the vast discrepancy between lurid journalistic accounts and the reality of prostitution. Evidence of widespread entrapment of British girls in London and abroad is slim. End quote. However, public furor over this ostensible problem, quote, forced the passage of the criminal law Amendment Act of 1885, a particularly nasty and pernicious piece of omnibus legislation. The 1885 Act raised the age of consent for girls from 13 to 16, but it also gave police far greater summary jurisdiction over poor working class women and children. It contained a clause making indecent acts between consenting male adults a crime, thus forming the basis of legal prosecution of male homosexuals in Britain until 1967. The clauses of the new bill were mainly enforced against working-class women and regulated adult rather than youthful sexual behavior. So it raised the age of consent to 16 from 13, 
in Britain. Apparently this is a problem for Gail Rubin. It did so under auspices that young British girls were being sexually exploited. In other words, it's like a sex trafficking law, but it also criminalized male homosexuality. And it says the clauses of the new bill were mainly enforced against working class women. So kind of this, I don't know, early kind of, they're trying to make it out to be like white British feminist kind of literature here. And this is again, quoting Walkowitz, um, Judith Walkowitz, a historian. So in the United States, we're back to Gail Rubin, the Mann Act, also known as the White Slave Traffic Act, was passed in 1910. Subsequently, every state in the union passed anti-prostitution legislation. So again, we're tying the race issue. Well, we can, we're, we're not going to have all this sex trafficking stuff because we're not going to have white sex slaves. We're not going to have prostitutes because it's like white sex slaves, etc. That That's the justification for outlawing all kinds of vice. That's the case she's making. In the 1950s, in the United States, major shifts in the organization of sexuality took place. Instead of focusing on prostitution or masturbation, the anxieties of the 1950s condensed most specifically around the image of the, quote, homosexual menace, and the dubious specter of the, quote, sex offender. Just before and after World War II, the, quote, sex offender became an object of public fear and scrutiny. Many states and cities, including Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York State, New York City, and Michigan, launched investigations to gather information about this menace to public safety. The term, quote, sex offender, sometimes applied to rapists, sometimes to, quote, child molesters. Funny thing to put in scare quotes, Gail. And eventually functioned as a code for homosexuals. In its bureaucratic, medical, and popular versions, the sex offender discourse tended to blur distinctions between violent sexual assault and illegal but consensual acts such as sodomy. The criminal justice system incorporated these concepts when an epidemic of sexual psychopath laws swept through state legislatures. These laws gave the psychological professions increased police powers over homosexuals and other sexual, quote, deviants. From the late 1940s until the early 1960s, erotic communities whose activities did not fit the post-war American dream drew intense persecution. So you're getting the picture, right? Here's all these things that people could be doing sexually, like child molestation, apparently, and they're being criminalized. And she's kind of giving a Foucauldian historical or historiographical or archaeological account of just how bad sex law was. And the reason that Foucault or Gail Rubin following Foucault would give an archaeological, as Foucault called it, or a historical or a genealogical account of how bad, say, sex law was throughout history is to point out that our sex laws are probably stupid too, which is what she's going to turn to. So she can have a new radical politics of sex. That's really the point here. That's what Foucault was up to with his critical genealogies or critical, critical archeologies, which are all historiographies. Frankly, by the way, that's what the 1619 project does too, except reframing what the purpose of the United States was. These are all ways to go back and rewrite history to say, look how stupid and wrong we were, or look how bad we were consistently, consistently, consistently. So nothing's actually any better now, and we'd be stupid to think that it is. Okay, so from the late 1940s until the early 1960s, erotic communities whose activities did not fit the post-war American dream grew intense persecution. Homosexuals were, along with communists, huh, that's interesting, homosexuals were, along with communists, the object of federal witch hunts and purges. Congressional investigations, executive orders, and sensational exposés in the media aimed to root out homosexuals employed by the government. Thousands lost their jobs, and restrictions on federal employment of homosexuals persist to this day. Again, 1984. The FBI began systematic surveillance and harassment of homosexuals, which lasted into the 1970s. It's really weird that we're talking about sexual politics, and we're already covering child molestation and all this stuff, and then we just drop in who got persecuted in the 1940s to 1960s, homosexuals and communists. Why is that there? Why are communists mentioned? Why are there communist sympathies being evoked here, being expressed here? Oh, wait, because it's friggin' Marxism. That's why. Many states and large cities conducted their own investigations. 
and the federal witch hunts were reflected in a variety of local crackdowns. In Boise, Idaho, in 1955, a school teacher sat down to breakfast with his morning paper and read that the vice president of the Idaho First National Bank had been arrested on felony sodomy charges. The local prosecutor had said that he intended to eliminate all homosexuality from the community. The teacher never finished his breakfast. Quote, he jumped up from his seat, pulled out his suitcases, packed as fast as he could, got into his car, and drove straight to San Francisco. The cold eggs, coffee, and toast remained on his table for two days before someone from his school came by to see what had happened. End quote. So now we have the dramatic story, the dramatic anecdote, oh how terrible, whole thing, blah blah blah, of somebody literally completely overreacting to something but that's how bad it was and how stupid our laws were. So therefore, Boise, Idaho puts forth this law in 1955, and there's a prosecution, and then this other guy freaks out, and somehow he's in this paper now. In San Francisco, police and media waged war on homosexuals throughout the 1950s. Police raided bars, patrolled cruising areas, conducted street sweeps, and trumpeted their intention of driving the queers out of San Francisco. This is based on a citation of a personal communication. Crackdowns against gay individuals, bars, and social areas occurred throughout the country. Although anti-homosexual crusades are the best documented examples of erotic repression in the 1950s, future research should reveal similar patterns of increased harassment against pornographic materials, prostitutes, and erotic deviants of all sorts. Research is needed to determine the full scope of both police persecution and regulatory reform. The current period bears some uncomfortable similarities to the 1880s, the current period being 1984, similarities to the 1880s and the 1950s. The 1977 campaign to repeal the Dade County, Florida Gay Rights Ordinance inaugurated a new wave of violence, state persecution, and legal initiatives directed against minority sexual populations and the commercial sex industry. For the last six years, the United States and Canada have undergone an extensive sexual repression in the political, not the psychological sense. In the spring of 1977, a few weeks before the Dade County vote, the news media were suddenly full of reports of raids on gay cruising areas, arrests for prostitution, and investigations into the manufacture and distribution of pornographic materials. Since then, police activity against the gay community has increased exponentially. The gay press has documented hundreds of arrests from the libraries of Boston to the streets of Houston and the beaches of San Francisco. Even the large, organized, and relatively powerful urban gay communities have been unable to stop these depredations. Gay bars and bathhouses have been busted with alarming frequency, and police have gotten bolder. In one especially dramatic incident, police in Toronto raided all four of the city's gay baths. They broke into cubicles with crowbars and hauled almost 300 men out into the winter streets clad in their bath towels. Even, quote, liberated San Francisco has not been immune. There have been proceedings against several bars, countless arrests made in the parks, and in the fall of 1981, police arrested over 400 people in a series of sweeps of Polk Street, one of the th thoroughfares of local gay nightlife. Queer bashing has become a significant recreational activity for young urban males, they come into gay neighborhoods armed with baseball bats and looking for trouble, knowing that the adults in their lives either secretly approve or will look the other way. That, by the way, is not cited. The police crackdown has not been limited to homosexuals. Since 1977, enforcement of existing laws against prostitution and obscenity has been stepped up. Moreover, states and municipalities have been passing new and tighter regulations on commercial sex. Restrictive ordinances have been passed, zoning laws altered, licensing and safety codes amended, sentences increased, and evidentiary requirements relaxed. The subtle legal codification of more stringent controls over adult sexual behavior has gone largely unnoticed outside of the gay press. Okay. Pause button. So this is going on in the 80s. This is what she's saying in the 80s. She's saying we had this kind of free or slightly free. The 1950s were really bad. Then things relaxed. Now they're tightening up again. This is exactly the same critical argument made in critical race theory about civil rights law. We had this really bad segregation period. Then we had the civil rights movement or yeah, and civil rights acts. Then we had all this great affirmative action, all these things that we wanted. So it's sexual liberation on the one hand. And then we have all this like handout culture on the racial hand. And then here we are, you know, getting toward the late 70s where 
what she doesn't mention is people were starting to notice this shit isn't working. This isn't good. Sexual liberation's not actually all it's cracked up to be in a lot of ways. There are lots of other problems that are coming up around it. Notice we're talking about right at the outbreak of the AIDS epidemic. Lots of things are going on. Lots of things are becoming a problem. People want to see a change. And so they start pulling back from some of that leftist ratchet driven so-called progress that had been made. And all of a sudden we have to say, oh my God, the reactionaries are out. They're taking away our affirmative action. They are cracking down on obscenity and perversion, et cetera, whatever it happens to be. And we can predict in our current era that we're going to see exactly this line of argumentation again, because we are now about to have a major pushback against both critical race theory and queer theory. They're going to say, oh, all the racial progress and all the sexual progress that we've made since the 1990s is being pulled back from us now, but it's not progress. Some of it might be, some of it might be a benefit. Some of these laws that there, you can point to a lot of bad laws, a lot of bad enforcement, a lot of mistakes, a lot of stupid stuff, a lot of problems, a lot of harm that didn't need to happen. You can point to a whole lot of stuff like that. But on the whole, there are, there are other problems as well. You can't merely point to, if you want to have an honest appraisal, you can't merely point to one side of an issue and say, look how bad it is that we're doing something about this. Unless all you want to do is continue to open, 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 which is exactly the Marxist program. So just in case you're getting sucked in by the siren song, notice she didn't mention any of the things, and I don't know them personally, but I guarantee you, um, I mean, the one for me, and I will alienate like a third of you on this, I have absolutely no, I I don't think that we need to have any criminalization of, of marijuana. I don't even think, I think it can be legal or whatever, so don't get too pissed. But I do think that we're going to see a walking back of it in public spaces because it's a public nuisance because it smells like shit. Nobody wants to be walking around and smell weed all the time everywhere. I'm actually sick of it. I go city to city to city and have to smell it all the friggin' time. I'm getting sick of it. So you open up and you're like, wait a minute, there are public nuisances. There are other problems. And you walk things back. And the radicals freak the hell out if you walk anything back. I don't know if that'll really happen with marijuana or not. Personally, I would like it. I don't want to smell it in public. Um... But what you're seeing here is a case where during the sexual liberation movement of the 60s, things relaxed, and then through the 70s, people realized not all that this led to is great. Stuff started to get pushed back the other way, and that is used as evidence of how um, terrible and evil the repressors are, how much repression there is, and how repression is making a comeback. Same thing with critical race theory. They, it's not quite the same, but they opened up all these entitlement programs. Then by the 70s, they were like, this isn't working. Let's back them up. And then critical race theory is like, blah, you're taking away our affirmative action. We need this forever. We need reparations. And it comes into existence in order to really push for more grift. And this is the pattern. This, I'm just pointing out a pattern. For over a century, she tells us, no tactic for stirring up erotic hysteria has been as reliable as the appeal to protect children. Oh boy. Huh. I told you, this thing is just unbelievable. Let me just read that sentence again. For over a century, not like forever, for over a century, no tactic for stirring up erotic hysteria has been as reliable as the appeal to protect children children. Mm -hmm. You really need to listen to what's being written here because we're going to hear this exact same stuff over the next 24 months, 12 months, two days, a lot. You're going to hear that Republicans are appealing to protect children when that's bogus, when the children actually need to be protected from Republicans or from conservatives or from abusers in the home, blah, 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 blah. And only by doing comprehensive sexuality education that they're doing, grooming kids in schools, can they possibly actually protect kids. And they're, they're going to say that they are saying that the right wing is appealing to the protection of children in order to be able to keep abusing them, which is 100% iron law of projection. The current wave of erotic terror, she says, has reached deepest into those areas bordered in some way, if only symbolically, by the sexuality of the young. I just remind you, this is where queer theory got its start. The motto of the Dade County repeal campaign was save our children from alleged homosexual recruitment. History rhymes, doesn't it? In February 17, sorry, 1977, February 19, I almost did it again. In February 1977, shortly before the Dade County vote, a sudden concern with, quote, child pornography. 
that's in quotes, swept the national media. A sudden concern with, quote, child pornography swept the national media. In May, the Chicago Tribune ran a lurid four-day series with three-inch headlines which claimed to expose a national vice ring organized to lure young boys into prostitution and pornography. Newspapers across the country ran similar stories, most of them worthy of the National Enquirer. By the end of May, a congressional investigation was underway. Within weeks, the federal government had enacted a sweeping bill against, quote, child pornography, and many of the states followed with bills of their own, right out of the gate. Child pornography, scare quotes, like it doesn't really exist. Like the concept of child porn is socially constructed to repress certain people. Hmm. This is the paper where queer theory started. These laws have reestablished restrictions on sexual materials that had been relaxed by some of the important Supreme Court decisions. For instance, the court ruled that neither nudity nor sexual activity per se were obscene. But the child pornography laws define as obscene any depiction of minors who are nude or engaged in sexual activity. But. (laughs) This means that photographs of naked children in anthropology textbooks. So you're hearing this exact thing, right? So they're showing the books that are getting taken out of schools and they're saying, look how ridiculous this example is, or that example is the example of that book Mouse about the the Nazis, M-A-U-S, for example. Look how ridiculous. That's the one they're going to appeal to. Meanwhile, all these groomer books like Lomboy and Gender Queer and like there's probably one called like My Willy Grows or something. There's all these weird books. We all know there's all these weird books. They don't talk about those. No, he does. <laughs> Where was I? Child pornography laws define as obscene any depiction of minors who are nude or engaged in sexual activity. This means that photographs of naked children in anthropology textbooks and many of the ethnographic movies shown in college classes are technically illegal in several states. They always like to pretend there's no such thing as discernment, right? That any judge of sound mind would clearly understand, because they have no discernment, would clearly understand that an uh, anthropological video, like a National Geographic showing people who happen to be naked because they don't wear clothes in their freaking culture, uh, is not obscene, or that... um, an anatomy textbook is clearly not pornography. They, it's like they have no discernment, and because the, but they pretend they don't have any so that they can get away with this crap. They're playing a legal technicality game so that they can break open the whole thing, and they want to say, well, you can't actually say. On what authority could you possibly say? It says depiction of nudity. Well, that's a depiction of nudity. Like, we can't tell the difference. Like, there's no discernment whatsoever possible. And they're using a legal technicality trick to say, well, nobody can actually define what's obscene, so nothing's obscene, and so you can't regulate obscenity. This means that photographs of naked children in anthropology anthropology textbooks and many of the ethnographic movies shown in college classes are technically illegal in several states. In fact, the instructors are liable to an additional felony charge for showing such images to each student under the age of 18. Isn't the law crazy? Although the Supreme Court has also ruled that it is a constitutional right to possess obscene material for private use, some child pornography laws prohibit even the possession of any sexual material involving minors. Is that not just like the, like the, can, can you read that and you, do you not just think, why the hell is this here? What are these people about? And you're like, oh yeah, groomers. The laws produced by the child porn panic, the child porn panic, the child porn panic. Let me just say that again. The child porn panic, the laws produced by the child porn panic are ill-conceived and misdirected. They represent far-reaching alterations in the regulation of sexual behavior and abrogate uh, abrogate important sexual civil liberties, but hardly anyone noticed as they swept through Congress and state legislatures. Important sexual civil liberties like owning child porn? Presenting it? Whew. Gail, girl, with the exception of the North American Man-Boy Love Association, literally, NAMBLA, with the exception of the North American Man-Boy Love Association, that's real, it still exists, NAMBLA, 
and American Civil Liberties Union, no one raised a peep of protest. Oh, the ACLU came to the defense of child porn. Wow. It's always worth looking up where the ACLU came from, and you'll find out that it was in fact founded and first chaired by communists. How about that? Everybody's like, OMG, we lost the ACLU. No, you never had the ACLU. You never had it. It did some really great and important work, which served as a very useful cover for the fact that it defended communist agitprop and communist maneuvers like child pornography. A new and even tougher federal child pornography bill has reached House-Senate conference. It removes any requirement that prosecutors must prove that alleged child pornography was distributed for commercial sale. Once this bill becomes law, a person merely possessing a nude snapshot of a 17-year-old lover or friend may go to jail for 15 years and be fined $100,000. The bill passed the House 400 to 1 really obsessed about. So here's the corner case. This is the corner case. Some bad thing could happen. Wouldn't be possible to adjudicate with wisdom. Sometimes that's going to fail. Not at all possible. 17-year-old lover. So who has a 17-year-old lover? Like a 40-year-old or like a 19-year-old? Wouldn't be possible to adjudicate. The law is the law is the law. And yeah, I get it. Sometimes stuff's going to get whack. Like there's no possible solution to this. Nope. Anybody possessing such a thing may go to jail for 15 years. Look how crazy the law is. How could we regulate child pornography? Which literally the last two paragraphs have just been about we shouldn't regulate child pornography. Thanks, Gail. The experiences of art photographer Jacqueline Livingston exemplify the climate created by the child porn panic. The child porn panic. The child porn panic. An assistant professor of photography at Cornell University, Livingston was fired in 1978 after exhibiting pictures of male nudes, which included photographs of her seven-year-old son masturbating. Could you freaking imagine? (laughs) When I read this paper, I I read it on an airplane, and I laughed out loud so many times people thought that I had lost my marbles. People were looking at me. There's a funnier stuff in this paper. Let me just read that again. An assistant professor of photography at Cornell University, Livingston was fired in 1978 after exhibiting pictures of male nudes, which included photographs of her seven-year-old son masturbating. (laughs) Bye, Felicia. Holy shit. Miss Magazine, Chrysalis, and Art News all refused to run ads for Livingston's posters of male nudes. At one point, Kodak confiscated some of her film, and for several months, Livingston lived with the threat of prosecution under the child pornography laws. She literally presented pictures of her seven-year-old playing with his dick. Are you kidding me? Gail Rubin can't figure out why this is, like, a thing. The Tompkins County Department of Social Services investigated her fitness as a parent. Really, no kidding. Livingston's posters have been collected by the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan, and other major museums, but she has paid a high cost in harassment and anxiety for her efforts to capture on film the uncensored male body at different ages. I don't know, like, why it's hard to not take a picture of your seven-year-old playing with his dick, but just, like, if you did that, why would you make a poster out of it and then go? Because you're a college professor, that's why. It's easy to see someone like Livingston as a victim of the child porn wars. (laughs) No, Gail, it's not. It's easy to see a a 19-year-old who has a picture of his 17-year-old girlfriend or something like that as a victim. That's easy. That's actually not that hard. One kid 18, one kid 17. Yeah, okay. That's not that hard. It's easy to see someone who took a picture of her 7-year-old masturbating and made posters of them that she put on display. No not a victim. It is easy to see someone like Livingston. This is how confused queer theory is. Someone like Livingston is a victim of the child porn wars. It is harder for most people to sympathize sympathize with actual boy lovers, but don't worry, Gail Rubin's about to. And what does she say next? Brace yourself. Like communists and homosexuals in the 1950s, boy lovers are so stigmatized that it is difficult to find defenders for their civil liberties, let alone for their erotic orientation. Erotic orientation. Boy lovers. Just like communists. 
stigmatized. This is the paper where queer theory started, folks. Consequently, the police have feasted on them. Local police, the FBI, and watchdog postal inspectors have joined to build a huge apparatus whose sole aim is to wipe out the community of men who love underaged youth. That's in print. This is a problem to Gail Rubin. In 20 years or so, so that would have been 2004, in 20 years or so, when some of the smoke has cleared, it will be much easier to show that these men have been the victims of a savage and undeserved witch hunt. Which men? The community of men who love underaged youth. In 20 years or so, by 2004, when some of the smoke has cleared, it will be much easier to show that the community of men who love underaged youth have been made the victims of a savage and undeserved witch hunt. There's your prediction from the first queer theorist. A lot of people will be embarrassed by their collaboration with this persecution, but will be too late to do much good for these men who have spent their lives in prison. She's literally saying that by 2004, queer theory will have been so successful that literal man-boy love, literal pederasty, literal pedophilia will be considered so normal that people will have been embarrassed to have tried to shut it down. While the misery of boy lovers affects very few, the long-term legacy of the Dade County repeal affects almost everyone. The success, so really extreme thing, Less extreme thing. Let's put them next to each other. The success of the anti-gay campaign ignited long-simmering passions of the American right and sparked an extensive movement to compress the boundaries of accept acceptable sexual behavior. Now I wish I would have done my homework better and looked up what actually was going on in Dade County in the late 70s to, figure, uh, to lead to these things that happened. I bet you there was more to the story than people got mad about gay people, and so there was a bunch of repression. I bet you there were problems. I'm just going to go out on a limb. Right-wing ideology linking non-familial sex with communism. Here we are again. Right-wing ideology linking non-familial sex with communism and political weakness is nothing new. During the McCarthy period, Alfred Kinsey and his Institute for Sex Research were <laughs> Alfred Kinsey and his Institute for Sex Research were attacked for weakening the moral fiber of Americans and rendering them more vulnerable to commit uh, sorry, to communist influence. No shit, that was literally a communist plot, like, to do that. But anyway, after congressional investigations and bad publicity, Kinsey's Rockefeller grant was terminated in 1954. Hmm, those Rockefellers always up to something. Around 1969, the extreme right, extreme right, extreme right, discovered the Sex Information and Education Council of the United States. Seek us. Guess who's informing your kid's school, by the way? Yeah, Seekus, turns out. In books and pamphlets such as The Sex Education Racket, Pornography in the Schools, and Seekus, Corrupter of Youth, the right attacks Seekus and sex education as communist plots to destroy the family and sap the national will. Based, holy shit, based, claims that the United... Oh, sorry, I skipped a word. Another pamphlet, Pavlov's, Pavlov's Children, They May Be Yours, uh, no attribution 1969, claims that the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, guess who is in cahoots with SICUS, and guess who is also shaping exactly your children's school, including comprehensive sex education. Guess where the comprehensive sex education guidelines came from in the first place? That's right, advice from UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So another pamphlet claims the United Nations uh, Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, is in cahoots with SICUS to undermine religious taboos, to promote the acceptance of abnormal sexual relations, to downgrade absolute moral standards, and to, quote, destroy racial cohesion by exposing white people, especially white women, to the alleged, quote, lower sexual standards of black people. New right and neoconservative ideology has updated these themes and leans heavily on linking, quote, immoral sexual behavior to putative declines in American power. In 1977, Norman, Norman Podhertz wrote an essay blaming homosexuals for the alleged inability of the United States to stand up to the Russians. Maybe that's a Ukrainian thing in 2022. He thus neatly linked the, quote, anti-gay fight in the domestic arena and the anti-communist battles in foreign policy. 
really focusing a lot on this communist stuff. The right-wing opposition to sex education, homosexuality, pornography, abortion, and premarital sex moved from the extreme fringes to the political center stage after 1977, when right-wing strategists and fundamentalist religious crusaders discovered that these issues had mass appeal. Oh no, the public is like all these things. Sex education, the way it may have been being done, Kinsey Institute, homosexuality, that's ambiguous because it's multiple, multifaceted. Pornography, abortion, premarital sex might have been creating some issues. <laughs> and there's a lot of mass appeal to fixing those issues. But this is right-wing strategists and fundamentalists and religious crusaders. Guess who's going to get blamed, by the way, for pushing back against what they're doing in groomer schools? That's right. Right-wing extremists, right-wing strategists, and fundamental religious crusaders. Sexual reaction played a significant role in the right's electoral success in 1980. That would be Ronald Reagan, etc. Organizations like the Moral Majority and Citizens for Decency have acquired mass followings, immense financial resources, and unanticipated clout. The Equal Rights Amendment has been defeated. Legislation has been passed that mandates new restrictions on abortion and funding for programs like Planned Parenthood, and sex education has been slashed. Laws and regulations making it more difficult for teenage girls to obtain contraceptions or contraceptives or abortions has been promulgated. Sexual backlash was exploited in successful attacks on the Women's Studies Program at California State University at Long Beach. Based. The most ambitious right-wing legislative initiative has been the Family Protection Act, FPA, introduced in Congress in 1979. The Family Protection Act is a broad assault on feminism, homosexuality, or sorry, homosexuals, non-traditional families, and teenage sexual privacy. The Family Protection Act has not and probably will not pass, but conservative members of Congress continue to pursue its agenda in a more piecemeal fashion. Perhaps the most glaring sign of the times is the Adolescent Family Life Program. Also known as the, as the Teen Chastity Program, it gets some 15 million federal dollars to encourage teenagers to refrain from sexual intercourse and to discourage them from using contraceptives if they do have sex and from having abortions if they get pregnant. In the last few years, there have been countless local confrontations over gay rights, sex education, abortion rights, adult bookstores, and public school curricula. Hmm. It's unlikely that the anti-sex backlash is over. Excuse me. Is over or that it has even peaked. Unless something changes dramatically, it is likely that the next few years will bring more of the same. Periods such as the 1880s in England and the 1950s in the United States recodify re the relations of sexuality. The struggles that were fought leave a residue in the form of laws, social practices, and ideologies which then affect the way in which sexuality is experienced long after the immediate conflicts have faded. All the signs that indicate the present era is another of those watersheds in the politics of sex. The settlements that emerge in the 1980s will have an impact far into the future. It is therefore imperative to understand what is going on and what is at stake in order to make informed decisions about what policies to support and oppose. It is difficult to make such decisions in the absence of a coherent and intelligent body of radical thought about sex. I would disagree, Gail. I fundamentally disagree. I think it is easier to make such decisions in the absence of, there is no such thing as a coherent and intelligent body of radical thought about sex. I think it is easier to make such decisions without a incoherent, aka queer, and unintelligent body of radical thought about sex. Unfortunately, she says progressive political analysis of sexuality is relatively underdeveloped. We're going to need a queer theory. Much of what is available from the feminist movement has simply added to the mystification that shrouds the subject. Hey, there's Marx. The mystification of the, the ideological mystification of whatever we're dealing with. There's an urgent need to develop radical perspectives on sexuality. That's going to be queer theory. Paradoxically, an explosion of exciting scholarship and political writing about sex has been generated in these bleak years. In the 1950s, the early gay rights movement began in uh, prospered while the bars were being raided and anti-gay laws were being passed. In the last six years, new erotic communities, political alliances, and analyses have been developed in the midst of the repression. In this essay, I will propose elements of a descriptive and conceptual framework for thinking about sex and its politics. 
I hope to contribute to the pressing task of creating an accurate, humane, and genuinely liberatory body of thought about sexuality. This will become queer theory. Let me just point out, accurate, humane, and genuinely liberatory is an oxymoron. You can have accurate and humane, but not liberatory. Or you can have liberatory and not accurate and humane. This is the fundamental Marxist lie, that they have the best analysis, the most accurate, the most humane, the most humanizing, the most scientific, when in fact what they have is a steaming pile of bullshit. So you can have liberatory or you can have accurate and humane. You don't get to pick both. If we were talking about actual what liberation should mean, absent all of the Marxist thought on liberation for a century and a half, we might be in a different, different situation here, but we're not. We're not in that situation. We're in the situation where liberatory means Marxist nonsense. And so you can't have them both. Next section is titled Sexual Thoughts. And it starts off with a fragment of a discussion between two gay men trying to decide if they may love each other. Cited from Barr, 1950. You see, Tim, Philip said suddenly, your argument isn't reasonable. Suppose I granted your first point that homosexuality is justifiable in certain instances and under certain controls. Then there is the catch. Where does the justification end and degeneracy begin? Society must condemn to protect. Permit even the intellectual homosexual a place of respect and the first bar is down. Then comes the next and the next until the sadist, the flagellist, the criminally insane demand their places and society ceases to exist. So I ask again, where is the line drawn? Where does degeneracy begin if not at the beginning of the individual freedom in such matters? This is really funny now that we're here. 30 years after Gail Rubin's essay, this thing from the 50s is claiming that there's going to be a sexual, uh, sexual slippery slope if you allow gay people to have relationships. And if you take down that bar, you can't tell the difference, is what he's saying. Where does justification end and d- degeneracy begin? If you say that homosexual sex, anything other than, than strict heterosexual procreative sex is okay, you won't be able to say what is and is not degenerate. So we're looking at kind of proto uh postmodern arguments that you won't be able to, that that, that the slope is slippery, so there's no way to tell the difference. There's no possibility of adjudicating. There's no possibility of discernment. There's no possibility whatsoever. And so there's this discussion, allegedly, is warning that, well, if we even pull down the first bar, then we're going to have total slippery slope. Therefore, they're not going to let the first bar get pulled down. And of course, that's a slippery slope argument. And of course, it's a fallacy. And of course, it isn't necessarily the case. And of course, it's exactly what the hell they did. They ruined themselves because it wasn't that we can't discern the difference between justification and degeneracy. It wasn't that we couldn't persuade ourselves morally to believe certain things in this regard and to say this is a reasonable place to go and to stop, for example, with regard to sex. Maybe it's perfectly fine for homosexuals to have homosexual relationships in the context of healthy relationships, but maybe it is not fine for them to actually go into degenerate behavior. Maybe it's perfectly fine in the realm of gender for there to be kind of masculine women, and they're still fully women, and kind of effeminate men, and they're still fully men, and that that's just different ways of being who you happen to be. But no, they had to go all the way to where you there is no such thing as man or woman to the point where a Supreme Court justice couldn't answer the question when asked directly by a senator, what is a woman? They shot themselves in the foot. They greased, they lubed up their slope and then said, there was nothing we could do. And it's because their stupid social constructivist ideology at the heart of their idea doesn't have the capacity to adjudicate. It does not have the capacity for discernment. It's everything goes or nothing goes. It's the only way they think about the world. Whereas normal, healthy adults are able to adjudicate the difference between justification, what's justified and what's degenerate without a whole lot. And there can be discussion, there can be arguing about it, there can be moral difference on on the matter, and we can still learn to live with one another. But not for the theorist, not for the social constructivist, not for these Marxist lunatics. All or nothing And so they say that nothing is obviously a huge, huge injustice because it is, therefore, all. They make their own slope slippery. And then they get upset when people say, 
this is a slippery slope, which would be wrong if it wasn't for the fact that they're sitting there lubing it up. Like they got the slipperiest silicone lube you can imagine just spread all over that thing. And they're like, it's flamboyantly as possible. This ain't slippery, don't worry. And it's like, oh my God, just don't put that on there. But they can't help themselves. That's what social constructivism does. I've actually had a number of podcasts talking specifically about that's what the nature of social constructivism. It's every woke slope is slippery is the title of a podcast I did. So what does she say? What are we having sexual thoughts? Is that what this is? Yeah, sexual thoughts. A radical theory of sex, she tells us, so queer theory, must identify, describe, explain, and denounce erotic injustice and sexual oppression. Such a theory needs refined conceptual tools. That sounds like bullshit which can grasp the subject and hold it in view. It must build rich descriptions of sexuality as it exists in society and history. It requires a convincing critical language that can, that can convey the barbarity, or sorry, barbarity, bar, 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 I've messed it up now, the barbarity of sexual persecution. It, she didn't mention that it needs apparently 500 genders and a different flag for every one of them, but apparently it needed that too. Several persistent features of thought about sex inhibit the development of such a theory. These assumptions are so pervasive in Western culture that they are rarely questioned. Thus, they tend to reappear in different political contexts, acquiring new rhetorical expressions but reproducing fundamental axioms. One such axiom is sexual essentialism, the idea that sex is a natural force that exists prior to social life and shapes institutions, which, by the way, Gail, you could have observed maybe at the dog park. Sexual essentialism is embedded in the folk wisdoms of Western societies, which consider sex to be eternally unchanging, asocial, and transhistorical. Dominated for over a century by medicine, psychiatry, and psychology, the academic study of sex has reproduced essentialism. These fields classify sex as a property of individuals. It may reside in their hormones or in their psyches. It may be construed as physiological or psychological. But within these ethno-scientific categories, sexuality has no history and no significant social determinants. Ethno-scientific. So remember, all science is ethno-science. It's not that there's any neutral science that says a fundamental claim, whether it's in Paulo Freire, whether it's in any of the feminists, whether it's in any of the Marxists, whether it's in any of the woke. All, there is no real science. There's no neutral science. We must abandon neutrality. All science is ethnoscience. So what you have is a chauvinistic claim that what we call science is one ethnoscience saying, no, we're the one that's not. And everybody else is ethnoscience, so we're going to ignore that. It's an ethnically centered claim upon being science when it's not science. Very Foucault. Very postmodern. During the last five years, a sophisticated, during the last five years, Okay. A sophisticated historical and theoretical scholarship has challenged sexual essentialism both explicitly and, pl and implicitly. Gay history, particularly the work of Jeffrey Weeks, has led this assault by showing that homosexuality as we know it is a relatively modern institutional complex. So we're going to rehash Foucault's history of sexuality. Here's what we're going to do. Many historians have come to see the contemporary institutional forms of heterosexuality as an even more recent development. An important contributor to the new scholarship is Judith Wachowitz, whose research has demonstrated the extent to which prostitution was transformed around the turn of the century. She provides meticulous descriptions of how the interplay of social forces such as ideology, funny that they would mention the Marxist one first, ideology, fear, political agitation, legal reform, and medical practice can change the structure of sexual behavior and alter its consequences. Michel Foucault's The History of Sexuality, 1978, told you, has been the most influential and emblematic text of the new scholarship on sex. Foucault criticizes the traditional understanding of sexuality as a natural libido yearning to break free of social constraint. Remember, Marxism is the belief that the social conditions limit the range of your subjective experience and what you can imagine yourself doing and thus enact, and it's socially enforced by other people having the same beliefs and preventing your imagination from wandering too far. Hmm. I wonder what Foucault's up to. Foucault criticizes the traditional understanding of sexuality as a natural libido yearning to break free of social constraint. Social constraint? Society is a prison. That's basically Foucault. It's also basically Gnosticism. 
He argues that desires are not pre-existing biological entities, but rather that they are constituted in the course of historically specific social practices. He emphasizes the generative aspects of the social organization of sex rather than its repressive elements by pointing out that new sexualities are constantly produced. Yeah, there are hundreds of them now. And he points to a major discontinuity between kinship-based systems of sexuality and more modern forms. The new scholarship on sexual behavior has given sex a history and created a constructivist alternative to sexual essentialism. Ta-da! Postmodern social constructivist, Marxist social constructivist alternative to essentialism, that it has something to do with your underlying biology. Underlying this body of work is an assumption that sexuality is constituted in society and history, not biologically ordained. So sex is assigned at birth. It's not something that's present at birth and observed that would be biologically ordained. It instead is constituted in society and history. So it's assigned by a scientific and ethno-scientific medical establishment that says, whoops, you have a willy, so you're a boy, and oops, you have a hoo-ha, so you're a girl. This does not mean the biological capacities are not prerequisites for human sexuality. It does not mean that human sexuality is not comprehensible in purely biological terms. Human organisms with human brains are necessary for human cultures, but no examination of the body or its parts can explain the nature and variety of human social systems. The belly's hunger gives no clues as to the complexities of cuisine. No, but if you actually understood how taste buds work, you probably could get pretty pretty good hint, actually, yeah, dumbass. The body, the brain, the genitalia, and the capacity for language are necessary for human sexuality. But they do not determine its content, its experiences, or its institutional forms. Moreover, we never encounter the body unmediated by the meanings that culture gives to it. To paraphrase Levi Strauss, my position on the relationship between biology and sexuality is a Kantianism without a transcendental libido. All right. Very pretentious, Gail. You defended child porn for the whole last section. It is impossible to think of with any clarity about the politics of race or gender as long as these are thought of as biological entities rather than as social constructs. So you're seeing in 1984, the shift into intersectional thought, race and gender are both brought up. The social constructivist lens, it's got to become critical though. So it's going to be the critical constructivist lens that we now call woke. This is what's emerging in, in 84. You can see it happening here in queer theory. Similarly, sexuality is impervious to political analysis so long as it is, it is primarily considered conceived as a biological phenomenon or as an aspect of individual psychology. Sexuality is as much a human product as our diets, methods of transportation, systems of etiquette, forms of labor, types of entertainment, processes of production, and modes of oppression. I feel like something has been missed, like that it feels good to put your wiener in things. Seems to be a biological thing there. Once sex is understood in terms of social analysis and historical understanding, a more realistic politics of sex becomes possible. More realistic. We always have to remember when we're dealing with Marxists and they say real, they mean matter of social formation. One may then think of sexual politics in terms of such phenomena as populations, neighborhoods, settlement patterns, migration, urban conflict, epidemiology, and police technology. Well, that's weird. There are more fruitful categories of thought than the more traditional ones of sin, disease, neurosis, pathology, decadence, pollution, or the decline and fall of empires, which we're working on right now. Decline and fall of empires, thanks to decadence, and pathology, and neurosis, and disease, probably sin, and pollution. Yeah. But no, we're going to think of it in terms of neighborhoods, population, settlement... Patterns, migration, urban conflict, epidemiology, and police technology. So we're going to think of it in terms of social control mechanisms and social developments instead. By detailing, and we're talking about sex here, by detailing the relationships between stigmatized erotic populations and the social forces which regulate them, works such as that of Alan Barube, John de Amelo, Emilio, sorry, Jeffrey Weeks, and Judith Walkowitz contain implicit categories of political analysis and criticism. Nevertheless, a constructivist perspective has displayed some political weaknesses. This has been most evident in misconstructions of Foucault's position. So we've got to defend Foucault and his postmodern view. Queer theory is the most postmodern of the critical theories. 
Because of his emphasis on the ways that sexuality is produced, Foucault has been vulnerable to interpretations that deny or minimize the reality of sexual repression in the more political sense. Foucault makes it abundantly clear that he is not denying the existence of sexual repression so much as inscribing it within a larger dynamic of social control and power, basically a Gnostic reading of society where everything's a prison. Just to summarize that, sexuality in Western societies, she says, has been structured within an extremely punitive social framework where everything's a prison and has been subjected to very real formal and informal controls. It is necessary to recognize repressive phenomena without resorting to the essentialist assumptions of the language of libido. It is important to hold repressive sexual practices in focus, even while situating them within a different totality in a more refined terminology. So we're not going to talk about the idea that maybe there are good reasons for limits on sexual freedom, or maybe there are good reasons for limits on sexual behavior, even if those are not legal, but are just advisory and somewhat socially enforced or strongly socially enforced. Maybe there are good reasons for this. No, we're not going to talk about it in terms of this. We're only going to talk about it in terms of the social constructivist paradigm, which is a Marxist paradigm that says that there are people in power who have decided that these are the rules and everybody's going to play by them, even if you're repressed by them. And that's your problem if you are. And that it's just a means of social control so they can set up society that, in a way that they benefit most from the way society is set up. That's the way we have to think about it. It can't be that there are actual good reasons because a social constructivist approach has to deny essentialism, which means it has to deny underlying biology and physical reality. That's literally what queer theory is saying. This is my taking off point. We're going to deny that there's any underlying physiological or real basis for any sexual mores any rules, any laws, anything to do with any of this, including child porn laws, as we just heard, including uh, man-boy love, aka pedophilia, as we just heard. Most radical thought about sex has been embedded within a model of the instincts and the restraints. Yeah, the Greeks did an okay job with that, to be honest with you. Concepts of sexual oppression have been lodged within the more biological understanding of sexuality. It's often easier to fall back on the notion of a natural libido subjected to inhumane repression than to reformulate concepts of sexual injustice within a more constructivist framework, but it is essential that we do so. So it's easier to actually talk about things in terms of reality instead of in terms of this linguistic pseudo-reality of postmodern queer theory, but it's crucial that we use the Marxist frame. That's what she's saying. Why? Because we need a radical critique of sexual arrangements that has the conceptual elegance of Foucault and the evocative passion of Reich. That's Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich wrote a book called The Sexual Revolution that is, he's a Marxist, total crackpot, holy shit, sexual liberation on like the craziest steroids, anything goes. Um, I had the displeasure of reading about a hundred pages of it so far. Uh, and that's, who's being evoked here. It, it is a shocking book. Um, and so we need the evocative passion of Reich who literally is like screaming about his desire for complete sexual liberation and the conceptual elegance, which is horseshit of Michel Foucault, which is basically actually an updated structuralist version of a Marxist framing of how reality works. The new scholarship on sex has brought a welcome insistence that sexual terms be restricted to their proper historical and social context and a cautionary skepticism towards sweeping generalizations, but it is important to be able to indicate groupings of erotic behavior and general trends within erotic discourse. In addition to sexual essentialism, there are at least five other ideological formations whose grip on sexual thought is so strong that to fail to discuss them is to remain enmeshed within them. More of that Gnostic imprisonment, unless we talk about and evoke the real hidden reality that we can express in language that doesn't really exist. These are sex negativity, which I talked about a minute ago, the fallacy of the misplaced scale, uh, of misplaced scale, sorry, the hierarchical valuation of sex acts, the domino theory of sexual peril, there's your slippery slope, and the lack of concept of benign sexual variation. Of these five, the most important is sex negativity. Western cultures generally consider sex to be a dangerous, destructive, negative force. Maybe. Most Christian tradition following Paul holds that sex is inherently sinful and may be redeemed if performed within a marriage for procreative purposes and if the pleasurable aspects are not enjoyed too much. 
in turn, that was a, that's a feminist dig, by the way. They always make that joke or slander. In this turn, the idea rests on the assumption that the genitalia are an intrinsically inferior part of the body, much lower and less holy than the mind, the soul, the heart, or even the upper part of the digestive system. The status of the excretory organs is close to that of the genitalia. You will notice that one of the excretory organs and one of the genitals is the same thing, but besides that, anyway. Such notions have by now re uh, acquired a life of their own and no longer depend solely on religion for their perseverance. The culture always treats sex with suspicion. It construes and judges almost any sexual practice in terms of its worst possible expression. Sex is presumed guilty until proven innocent. Virtually all erotic behavior is considered bad unless a specific person to exempt it, sorry, a specific reason to exempt it has been established. The most acceptable excuses are marriage, reproduction, and love. Sometimes scientific curiosity, aesthetic experience, or a long-term intimate relationship may serve. But the exercise of erotic capacity, intelligence, curiosity, or creativity all require pretexts that are unnecessary for other pleasures, such as the enjoyment of food, fiction, or astronomy. Lord, what do I do with that? You know that the enjoyment of food has to do with being hungry, right? And there are all kinds of weird rules and taboos about food, right? Like, seriously? Okay. What I call the fallacy of misplaced scale is a corollary of sex negativity. Susan Sontag once com commented that since Christianity focused on sexual behavior as a root of virtue, everything pertaining to sex has been a, quote, special case in our culture. Sex law has been incorporated, uh, or sorry, has incorporated the religious attitude that heretical sex is an especially heinous sin that deserves the harshest punishments throughout much of the European and American uh, I keep adding in articles. Throughout much of European and American history, a single act of consensual anal penetration was grounds for execution. In some states, sodomy still carries 25-year prison sentences. Outside the law, sex is also a marked category. Small differences in value or behavior are often expressed as cosmic threats. Although people can be intolerant, silly, or pushy about what constitutes proper diet, differences in menu rarely provoke this, the kinds of rage, anxiety, and sheer terror that routinely accompany differences in erotic taste. You will eat the bugs. Sexual acts are burdened with an excess of significance. That may or may not be true, but you can see the destructive purposes behind what's actually being said. Modern Western science societies appraise sex acts according to a hierarchical system of sexual value. Maritable, marital, reproductive heterosexuals alone at the top of the erotic pyramid. Are alone at the top of the erotic pyramid, sorry. Clamoring below are unmarried monogamous heterosexuals in couples, followed by most other heterosexuals. Solitary floats ambiguously. That's masturbation, y'all. The powerful 19th century stigma on masturbation lingers in less potent modified forms, such as the idea that masturbation is an inferior substitute for partnered encounters. Stable, long-term lesbian and gay male couples are verging on respectability, but bar dykes and promiscuous gay men are hovering just above the groups at the very bottom of the pyramid. The most despised sexual castes currently include transsexuals, transvestites, fetishists, sadomasochists, sex workers such as prostitutes and porn models, and the lowliest of all, those whose eroticism transgresses generational boundaries. Mm, now we find a, <laughs> a euphemism for pedophiles. Individuals whose behavior stands high in this hierarchy are rewarded with certified mental health, respectability, legal legality, social and physical mobility, institutional support, and material benefits. As sexual behaviors or occupations fall lower on the scale, the individuals who practice them are subjected to a presumption of mental illness, disreput disreputability, criminality, restricted social and physical mobility, loss of institutional support, and economic sanctions. Extreme and punitive stigma maintains some sexual behaviors as low status and is an effective sanction against those who engage in them. The intensity of this stigma is rooted in Western religious traditions. Just stated. No possible reality underneath it, just a religious thing. But most of its contemporary content derives from medical and psychiatric opprobrium. 
The old religious taboos were primarily based on kinship forms of social organization. They were meant to deter inappropriate unions and to provide proper kin. Sex laws derived from biblical pronouncements were aimed at preventing the acquisition of the wrong kinds of affinal, par affinal partners, sorry, consanguous kin, that is incest, uh, the same gender, homosexuality, or the wrong species, bestiality. It makes an appearance here. When medicine and psychiatry acquired extensive powers over sexuality, they were less concerned with unsuitable mates than with unfit forms of desire. If taboos against incest best characterized kinship systems of sexual organization, then the shift to an emphasis on taboos against masturbation was, in a, was more apposite to the newer systems organized around qualities of erotic experience. And this cites Foucault. Medicine and psychiatry multiplied categories of sexual misconduct. The section on psychosexual disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the Mental and Physical Disorders, the DSM, of the American Psychiatric Association is a fairly reliable map of the current moral hierarchy of sexual activities. The APA list is much more elaborate than the traditional condemnations of whoring, sodomy, and adultery. The most recent edition, DSM-3, removed homosexuality from the roster of mental disorders after a long political struggle, but fetishism, sadism, masochism, transsexuality, transvestism, exhibitionism, voyeurism, and pedophilia are still firmly, quite firmly entrenched as psychological malfunctions. American Psychiatric Association, 1980. I wonder how many of those are still... Books are still being written about the genesis, etiology, treatment, and cure of these assorted pathologies. That's in quotes. Not pathologies. Fetishism, sadism, masochism, transsexuality, transvestism, exhibitionism, voyeurism, and pedophilia. Quote-unquote pathologies. As she has it. Psychiatric condemnation of sexual behaviors invokes concepts of mental and emotional inferiority rather than categories of sexual sin. Low-status sex practices are vilified as mental diseases or symptoms of defective personality integration. It's not that they might actually be those things for Gail. It is that they are low-status on the hierarchy created by the people in power who get to decide what sex is normal and what sex is weirdo. In addition, psychological terms conflate difficulties of psychodynamic functioning with modes of erotic content. They equate sexual masochism with self-destructive personality patterns, sexual sadism with emotional aggression, and homoeroticism with immaturity. These terminological muddles have become powerful stereotypes that are indiscriminately applied to individuals on the basis of their sexual orientations. Popular culture is permeated with ideas that erotic variety is dangerous, unhealthy, depraved, and a menace to everything from small children to national security. They always try to make everything like that, right? Like, look how ridiculous it is. But there's some points, literally, in all of that. Popular sexual ideology is a noxious stew made up of ideas of sexual sin, concepts of psychological inferiority, anti-communism, mob hysteria, accusations of witchcraft, and xenophobia. Hmm. The mass media nourish these attitudes with, with relentless propaganda. Iron Law of Oak Projection. Future edition. I would call this system of erotic stigma the last socially respectable form of prejudice if the old forms did not so show such obstinate vitality and the new ones did not continually become apparent. All these hierarchies of sexual value, religious, psychiatric, and popular function in much the same ways as do ideological systems of racism, ethnocentrism, and religious chauvinism. They rationalize the well-being of the sexually privileged and the adversity of the sexual rabble. It's a Marxist identity theory, and that the, pre the, the precursor to intersectionality is right there. We have to, they're all the same, she just said, they're all the same. Racism, ethnocentrism, religious chauvinism, they, and queer theory, as it's coming into being, all rationalize the well-being, there's your mythology, your Marxist mythology, the well-being of the privileged against the adversity of the, the masses. There's a couple of awesome diagrams. I don't know if I'm going to go into them too much, but we'll see. The figure 9.1 diagrams a general version of the sexual value system. According to this system, sexuality that is, quote, good, quote, normal, and, quote, natural should ideally be heterosexual, marital, monogamous, reproductive, and non-commercial. It should be coupled, relational, sorry, coupled, 
relational within the same generation and occur at home. Now, within the same generation. Yeah, but we know what you're saying here. It should not involve pornography, fetish objects, sex toys of any sort, or roles other than male and female. No furries. Any sex that violates these rules is, quote, bad, quote, abnormal, or, quote, unnatural. Bad sex may be homosexual, unmarried, promiscuous, non-procreative, or commercial. It may be masturbatory or take place at orgies, may be casual, may cross generational lines, and, mm-hmm, and may take place in, quote, public, or at least in the bushes or the baths. It may involve the use of pornography, fetish objects, sex toys, and unusual roles. So the graphic is one of these wheels of power where there's the okay stuff in the middle and the bad stuff on the outside that you see all the time. I'm not going to go through it all, but you've seen these wheels, right? So there's the acceptable version close to the center, the marginalized, unacceptable version out near the edge. And the goal of the Marxist idea is always to bring margin to center because power lies at the center and people have granted themselves greater access to the center because that's where they want to be. And they keep everybody else out at the margin by social enforcement. Okay. So we won't go through that. Figure 9.2 is a little funnier diagram. Uh, Another aspect of the sexual hierarchy, the need to draw and maintain an imaginary line between good and bad sex. Most of the discourses on sex, be they religious, psychiatric, popular, or political, delimit a very small portion of human sexual capacity as sanctifiable, safe, healthy, mature, legal, or politically correct. The, quote, line distinguishes these forms from all other erotic behaviors, which are understood to be the work of the devil dangerous, psychopathological, infantile, or politically reprehensible. Arguments are then conducted over, quote, where to draw the line and to determine what other activities, if any, may be permitted to cross over into acceptability. Yes, Gail, some stuff is acceptable, some stuff is not acceptable, and yeah, the line's a little fuzzy sometimes, and that's where discernment comes in, and people are capable of it. We don't need to obliterate all lines, which is what queer theory wants to do, because you have the you have a problem with the fact that there's negotiation about the fact of where the lines lie. This is not actually complicated unless you're a queer theorist. So this graphic, I said, is kind of fun because it shows actually a series of brick walls from best to worst. The sex hierarchy, the struggle of where to draw the line, and it says... The line is a brick wall, and there are three of them, but the first one says good sex, normal, natural, healthy, holy, uh, heterosexuals, married, monogamous, reproductive, at home. I'm going to try to actually zoom in so I can see read this. Major area of contest, we're getting into the second and third brick walls, which are smaller and further away. Unmarried, heterosexual, couples, promiscuous, heterosexuals, masturbation, long-term, stable, lesbian, and gay male couples, lesbians in the bar, uh, promiscuous gay men at the baths or in the park, and then we get to, those are the contest areas, bad sex, abnormal, unnatural, sick, sinful, way out, and it's transvestites, transsexuality, or transsexuals, fetishists, sadomasochists, for money, and cross-generational, listed as worst. Yep, correct. Well spotted, Gail. All these models assume a domino theory of sexual peril. The line appears to stand between sexual order and chaos. It expresses the fear that if anything is permitted to cross the erotic DMZ, the barrier against scary sex will crumble and something unspeakable will skitter across. Now here's the deal. As all these people were trying to expand the range of sex, whether it's the sexual liberation movements, which were mostly Marxist in reality, but there's always a liberal component that's going along with them. It's like, yeah, they have a point. Let's do some of this. Let's open some of this stuff up. Let's not be so rigid. Let's be a little less harsh. Let's not be so judgmental, etc. And then you have those people saying, well, this isn't a slippery slope. But then, like I said, you've got the queer theorists over here literally laying lube all over the the slope. So it'll be slippery as hell. And then you have the social conservatives pointing and saying that is a slippery slope. Look at those dudes putting the grease on there. Except, unfortunately, the social conservatives are very rarely that discerning. And they just see the whole thing as one thing. And they look like clowns because they can't distinguish between, let's say, the gay agenda and the queer agenda. And so what happens is this: nobody believes the people saying the slope is slippery. A lot of people are that are they say, yeah, there's a real point here. Let's expand things. And then you literally have the queer theorists over there just like dumping a gigantic bucket of silicone lube down the slope and then um, saying, no, you're oppressing me. If you tell them to stop making the slope so slippery or if you say this is going to cause a backlash when this goes too far, which it inevitably will because you slipped up the slope. 
uh, then you're a dangerous conspiracy theorist and a terrible person. This is the game that they keep playing. All these models assume a domino theory. Oops, sorry, I already did that part. Most systems of sexual judgment, religious, psychological, feminist, or socialist, attempt to determine on which side of the line a particular act falls. Only sex acts on the good side of the line are accorded moral complexity. For instance, heterosexual encounters may be sublime or disgusting, free or forced, healing or destructive, romantic or mercenary. As long as it does not violate other rules, heterosexuality is acknowledged to exhibit the full range of human experience. In contrast, all sex acts on the bad side of the line are considered utterly repulsive and devoid of all emotional nuance. The further from this line from the line a sex act is, the more it is depicted as uniformly as a uniformly bad experience. Now what we're setting up here is repressive tolerance for sex. She's saying that there is in fact a repressive tolerance for sex. So if we follow Marcuse, who also was important in the sex uh, sexual liberation movement, we know what's coming next. Not necessarily in this essay, but with queer theory in general, what the goal will be is we're going to need a liberating tolerance where we tolerate that and we shun the things. We, we tolerate the, the, the expansionary leftist thing, the bad thing, and we re- withdraw tolerance from the normal thing. In other words, it's a Marxist war on the normal. And we see it right here. But you've heard the setup of repressive tolerance. On one side of the line, everything gets all the special treatment. On the other side of the line, everything is, gets no special treatment. And so their goal is going to be to flip over which side of the line gets special treatment and which side of the line is utterly repressed in order to create liberation. It's a literal recreation of the Marcusean critical model now in terms of weirdo pervert sex. And I use pervert because, as we heard, it's her word. As the re- uh, sorry, As a result of the sex conflicts of the last decade, some behavior near the border is inching across it. Unmarried couples living together, masturbation, and some forms of homosexuality are moving in the direction of respectability, hence the three brick walls in uh, the figure. Most homosexuality is still on the bad side of the line, but if it's coupled and monogamous, the society is beginning to recognize that it includes a full range of human interaction. Remember when they told the world that Pete Buttigieg wasn't gay enough because he dresses in suits and he straight passes and he lives, you know, he's in a couple, stable coupled relationship. And then remember when Hannah Dyer said that it's a misconception that queer theory exists to create a stable LGBTQ identity because its goal is to create a fluid identity that never stabilizes. Well, here you go. Most homosexuality is still on the bad side of the line, but if it is coupled and monogamous, in other words, a healthy relationship, the society is beginning to recognize that it includes the full range of human interaction. Promiscuous homosexuality, sadomasochism, fetishism, transsexuality, and cross-generational encounters are still viewed as unmodulated horrors, incapable of involving affection, love, free choice, kindness, or or transcendence. Now hold on. Let me just break open the euphemism here. Cross-generational encounters. Okay, so I want you to imagine that, because I know some people like this, I want you to imagine a friend of mine, in fact, who's just shy of 40, he met a girl, she was 20, they started dating, they ended up married, they have kids, they're still married, she's batting up on 40 now. So that's cross-generational, right? Because he was almost 40, she was 20, they're in different generations. Do these words, like you might say, you might giggle, you might, uh, you know, or you might poo-poo, or you might say, yeah, whatever. To that, but do these words apply? Unmodulated horrors incapable of involving affection, love, free choice, kindness, and transcendence? Nope. But imagine if he were 35, 38, 45, and she were 12. Unmodulated horrors incapable of involving affection, love. Ah, yes. Cross generational encounters don't mean daddy in the colloquial sense, not the literal incest sense. They don't mean cougar. Cross-generational encounters mean pedophilia. And you have to pay attention to that because it's going to come up a bunch of times. Because a 45-year-old woman hooking up with a 22-year-old man and having a fun night or whatever is not viewed as unmodulated horrors incapable of involving affection, love, free choice, kindness, or transcendence. 
but a 40-something-year-old with a 12-year-old sure as hell is. We know what you're talking about, Gail. Now you know what you're, we know you know what you're talking about because you've stopped calling it pedophilia and you've hidden it in a euphemism, cross-generational encounters. You know what you're doing, you freaking pedo groomer. Oh my God. Whether you've groomed pedos or not, as a pedo or not, if you've groomed kids or not, I don't know, but you're defending it. Just like when you invoke the NAMBLA, the National Man-Boy Love Association. Come on. We see right through you. But anyway, I digress. This kind of sexual morality, she says, has more in common with ideologies of racism than with true ethics. Mm -hmm. Because racism isn't redefined by this point to be systemic and therefore Marxist and therefore okay. It grants more virtue to the dominant groups and relegates vice to the underprivileged. Aha! Marxism. A democratic morality, well, there's that Marxist use of the word democratic where everybody's equal. A democratic morality should judge sex acts by the way partners treat one another, the level of mutual consideration, the presence or absence of coercion, and quantity and quality of the pleasures they provide. You know, and this is where the typical liberal person's like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I agree with a lot of that. Totally. Consenting adults. But then you remember there's the cross-generational encounters part where it's not possible because cross-generational encounters involving minors are rape. They are rape. They are rape. There is no other way around it. They're just rape. But I digress. This is where the liberal comes in and says a lot of that I agree with. So Gail Rubin's okay. No, Gail Rubin's not okay. Gail Rubin's playing a game. Whether sex acts are gay or straight, coupled or in groups, rank, naked or in underwear, commercial or free, with or without video, should not be ethical concerns. Well, to most degrees, certainly, between consenting adults. But you've got a problem here on your hands. It is difficult to develop a pluralistic sexual ethics without a concept of benign sexual variation. Variation is a fundamental property of all life, from the simplest biological organisms to the most complex human social formations. Yet sexuality is supposed to conform to a single standard. One of the most tenacious ideas about sex is that there's one best way to do it and that everybody should do it that way. Most people find it difficult to grasp that whatever they like to do sexually will be thoroughly repulsive to someone else. I don't think that's true. I don't think that you've grasped onto the word of most. Most people. No. And that whatever repels them sexually will be the most treasured delight of someone somewhere. Yeah, so what? There's weirdos. Okay, great. One need not like or perform a particular sex act in order to recognize that someone else will and that this difference does not indicate a lack of good taste, mental health, or intelligence in either party, except that it might. It does not necessarily indicate one would be a better phrasing, but it sure as hell might. Most people mistake their sexual preferences for a universal system that will or should work for everyone. This notion of a single sexuality... A single ideal sexuality characterizes most systems of thought about sex. For religion, the ideal is procreative marriage. For psychology, it is mature heterosexuality. Although its content varies, the format of a single sexual standard is continually reconstituted within other rhetorical frameworks, including feminism and socialism. Funny how that keeps coming up. It is just as objectionable to insist that everyone should be lesbian, non-monogamous or kinky as to believe that everyone should be heterosexual, married, or vanilla. There's your liberal saying, yeah, though the latter set of opinions are hacked by considerably more coercive power than, sorry, backed. Though the latter set of opinions are backed by considerably more coercive power than the former. There's always an imbalance of power when you have a critical theory engaged. Progressives who would be ashamed to display cultural chauvinism in other areas routinely exhibit it toward sexual differences. So here we see always, it, they aren't attacking soft targets that they think they can get away with. They're attacking people they know they can manipulate. It's a different thing. So they're going, hey, progressives, you think you're so progressive? You uphold yourself to progressive? This is altar casting. It's a technique to put somebody into a moral role that they'll then try to live up to. You think you're so great and progressive? You'd be ashamed to display cultural chauvinism in any other area, but you routinely exhibit it towards sexual differences. So it's to twist the ratchet on the left, to make the left more radically left, to Make sure that you have a very ra very concentrated radical cadre that can flip over society. That's their strategic point here. 
We have learned to cherish different cultures as unique expressions of human inventiveness rather than the inferior or disgusting habits of savages. We need a similarly anthropological understanding of different sexual cultures. Empirical sex research is the one field that does incorporate a positive concept of sexual variation. Alfred Kinsey, mm -hmm, approached the study of sex with the same uninhibited curiosity he had previously applied to examining a species of wasp. That makes sense. His scientific detachment, I thought that was impossible, gave his work a refreshing neutrality. Whoops. So he's neutral? Because he's on your side. That enraged moralists and caused immense controversy. Among Kinsey's successors, John Gan uh, Gagnon? Gannon, I don't know, G-A-G-N-O-N, and William Simon have pioneered the application of sociological understandings to erotic variety. Even some of the older sexology is useful. Although his work is imbued with unappetizing eugenic beliefs, Havelock Ellis was a acute, or sorry, was an acute and sympathetic observer. His monumental studies in the psychology of sex is resplendent with detail. I'm sure it's wonderful. Much of the political, much political writing on sexuality reveals complete ignorance of both classical sexology and modern sex research. Perhaps this is because so few colleges and universities bother to teach human sexuality and because so much stigma adheres even to scholarly investigation of sex. Yet again, twist the ratchet where it will turn. Neither sexology nor sex research has been immune to the prevailing sexual value system. Both contain assumptions and information which should not be accepted uncritically, but sexology and sex research provide abundant detail, a welcome posture of calm, and a welcomed, uh, sorry, a well-developed ability to treat sexual variety as something that exists rather than something to be exterminated. These fields can provide an empirical grounding for a radical theory of sexuality more useful than the combination of psychoanalysis and feminist first principles to which so many texts resort. So, in the interest of time, because I have something else to do, frankly, soon, I'm going to stop this here and do this essay in three parts. So now we've got a taste of the origin story of queer theory. Gail Rubin's Thinking Sex from 1984, looking for a new politics of sex and sexuality, and we hear what it entails. We're defending a lot of different kinds of perversion. I mean, actual perversion. We're going to hear some really funny stuff later about S&M, so hold tight. Uh, we're seeing the typical maneuvers of tapping into uh, liberal sensibilities to say, yeah, that's reasonable. There's some nonsense, but the, but the through line is reasonable. And that's where, you know, they're looking at the slope and they're saying, yeah, it doesn't have to be slippery. Meanwhile, you literally have these people that are the theorists dumping lube down it and social conservatives saying you are all bad. And what happens is the liberals take up with the leftists rather than the liberals taking up with the conservatives against the people who are about to destroy society for real. And this trick works again and again. You see the twisting of the ratchet in leftist organizations. The reason is to actually move enough of the left so far left that what you end up with, whether it's universities, whether it's progressives, what you do is you get them so entrenched what they are that you actually fracture society. You have mainstream society and then you have the left. And if the left gets big enough and loud enough, you can't ignore it anymore. And you literally have a fracture in society. We have exactly that rift. You can see the graph where the conservatives have moved very little. And the uh, left has moved very far left. You could look at Colin Wright's, who, by the way, also talks very good about, very well about queer theory and biology. You can look at his, you know, graphic that Elon Musk tweeted, where it shows him standing still and someone near the center standing still, and then the left running further and further to the left, so that the political center just keeps moving. He calls it his political journey. I actually bought his coffee mug. You should, you should get it too. Um, it's kind of cool, but it shows, you know, he never moved. He's right there kind of near the middle. He's in center left. The right is over here on the right, not moving. And the person on the left goes left, 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 and three stages is running left. And then at the end is way off to the left. And so the center has moved. So now he looks like he's center right. The right wing person's never moved. He's never moved. But he went from being moderately left to center right um, over the course of the stages of the left going completely bonkers. And the data actually backed that up, which is mostly confirmed by the fact that there were fact checks saying that it must be false, which means that it's definitely true. Um, but the, the data actually do back it up. The left has done this. And the point of the left attacking neighboring um, ideological 
areas or domains is to drag them hard to the left like that so that the point is to fracture society because when you're dealing with marxist radicals the goal is to fracture a society so that it's dysfunctional and then to sweep in with the solutions that you're going to use to fix it and that's exactly what we're dealing with so we see this happening with sex you see her openly defending child pornography so-called man boy love cross-generational uh, experiences or whatever the heck she called it a paragraph or two back uh, a blatant euphemism that we now know i mean it's very clear uh, that she's lying about what's going on. Um, we're getting a real sense of what queer theory is about, though. It's going to defend not LGBT stuff or LGB stuff. It's going to defend queer politics. It's going to defend queer people or gay people being queer, but not gay people being just gay. She's already gone after that coupled monogamous gay relationships are becoming acceptable and they're kind of a problem she's pointing out it's going to defend pedophilia child pornography and all kinds of deviance and, and kink later I, I don't want to spoil the joke there's some funny stuff about what she says about what what should be allowed with s m which of course we tie this back to like these fetish things where they were now they are fetish parades with people in their fetish outfits messing around with kids and it's like they you see that queer theory is like this idea there's something wrong with the way that Gail Rubin's thinking about this issue to where there should be no limits, there should be no barriers, and the idea that any barrier that exists is actually an affront to people's liberation. Anybody being able to, whether those are legal limits, whether those are psychological analyses, that maybe somebody is psychologically damaged and that's why they want to do whatever it is that they're doing, maybe they're not. Or whether it's literally just social engagement, like keep your groomer hands off my kids, that's freaking not okay. Or dude, you know, keep your leathers, do your thing, close your door, I don't want to see it, don't be out humping in the yard or in the bushes or Maybe we don't need bathhouses and whatever else uh, might come with it. What we're seeing, though, is this, this mentality that everything should just be fully expanded. And if it's not, it's creating oppression. And so you're seeing this idea of normalcy, whether legal, psychological, or social, being an oppressive force subjected to a Marxist analysis, which is why queer theory is queer Marxism. The gender ideology within it is gender Marxism. Uh, the sexual theory contained within it is sexual Marxism, and you're hearing the appeals, the weird appeals to socialist ideas and straight up to communism, and that these weird sexual things are associated with communism that just kind of get tucked in here. Uh, I don't remember for certain because I read a lot of things, but if I'm not mistaken, I think Marx is deliberately and explicitly invoked later, or Marxism is deliberately and explicitly invoked later uh, by name, but I could be misremembering. So at any rate, we'll pick back up with this soon. We've got a couple more, uh, a few more sections to go through, and there are, therefore a few more, uh, or maybe two more episodes to get through this, this essay. But you're already starting to get the sense that from its very beginning, this being the very first queer theory paper, queer theory has a dark heart beating within it. It's talked way too much about child porn and way too much about pedophilia in not just positive terms, not just with the weird scare quotes, but even hiding it behind a euphemism so that it can talk about it as though it's not what it is to avoid the stigma that it's. they know they're not going to escape cross-generational encounters, which we know don't represent a 50-year-old dating a 20-year-old nearly in the same way that they would represent a 40-year-old dating a 15-year-old um, or a 10-year-old. We know there's a difference. Everybody knows there's a difference, except somehow queer theorists don't know there's a difference. And so... I'll close this off here. This is the birth of queer theory. Now you're hearing where it comes from. Now you're getting some idea. We're going to do more of this paper so you can hear the true origin point of queer theory. This isn't Judith Butler, I know. This is Gail Rubin, Thinking Sex from 1984, widely considered to be the first paper launching the ship that became queer theory five to seven or ten years later. Thanks for listening. Catch you on the next one.